You know, you've got two little things. You got the little angel and the little devil, and the little devil said, don't be a pussy. If I've been known for any one thing in my life, it's not being a pussy. I listened to this guy over here and sent it. Skiing was what I loved to do, and freestyle was definitely the best way for me to do it. Just being a part of that culture, the lifestyle, it was, it was the bee's knees for sure. It's what I wanted. I took it from being a local club skier and I made it to the provincial team and I had aspirations to go World Cup. But I think my aspirations for the lifestyle and the culture were even stronger and I, I think that's a part of why I never really made it. Moved into coaching and a couple years into coaching, landed a pretty gravy job here in Silverstar. Coaching legends like TJ Schiller, Justin Dory, Riley Lebo, Josh Bibby. I'm just stoking all my boys from Vernon here. Incredible. Like, I, I can't put words to how talented this group of kids is and was at that point in time. And they were far better skiers than I'd ever been already. That uh, was a good place to be. I think it was even more rewarding than being an athlete. I. I was skiing by far my best when I was a coach. And you're damn right, so I was in there all the time and I was always in the mix. It was the last day of site preparation and the first day of official training for the Canadian Junior Nationals. After a day of shaping and building all the jumps, I wanted to hike up and hit it for myself. I remember hiking up the in-run, doing a speed check, and I hiked it maybe three quarters of the way up the in-run and going down realized right away that there wasn't enough speed. Without hesitating, I go right to the top of the in-run, assuming that's gonna be the right speed. And again, without even thinking twice, I dropped down the in-run, going for a stock Superman front flip. I was probably half, three quarters of the way down the in-run, and right away I was like, holy shit. You know, this is too much speed. The landing hill came and went, and I probably dropped from like 100 feet and just slightly over-rotated it. I remember looking down, I landed on the tips of my skis and then just came down so chest heavy and with that rotation in the front, the weight of my ski boots came around and smacked me in the back of the head and it was lights out. When I landed, the, the force of my skis coming around dislocated my back and severed my spinal cord so it cut all the nerve endings. So unbeknownst to me at the time, I couldn't move anything, but I, I couldn't feel anything. So I was like, all right, but I could tell by the look, everybody had seen a ghost. Once the news got broken to me that it was gonna be paralysis and it's a permanent thing, honestly, more than the fear of what had happened was an overwhelming guilt about making such a shitty decision that impacted so many other people. The invasion of the surgery was brutal. The only thing that trumped that was looking in my dad's eyes and, and seeing the pain that we both shared. You know, he had dreams for his boy and I had dreams that I wanted to live and we both knew that shit had stopped. I wouldn't want to go back there and I'll tell you that I wouldn't want to wish that moment on my worst enemy. You know, physical and emotional pain like that just doubled up. I think probably the biggest turning point for me was when the doctor in the emergency room broke it down for me. And he basically just told me that I'm going to kick ass in a wheelchair and before I know it, I'm going to be back in the mountains riding a sit ski. I don't know how he composed himself to come into that room to break it down for a 23-year-old kid that loves to ski, that loves to bike, that loves to hike, that loves to play soccer. At that point in time, you know, I had a, a strong internal drive to keep moving forward because of the guilt that I had put on myself for putting everybody through it. So I told everybody on the speakerphone that day, I said, you know what? I want you guys to celebrate skiing for me. I said, I want you guys to love it the way I loved it. There's nothing to mourn here because I'm going to be back. I said, I promise you that I'm going to be back in the mountains. I didn't know what a sit ski looked like, but I knew that I was going to be back in the mountains doing what I love to do. Truth be known, my back healed up pretty well, and I was in the sit ski faster than somebody would have turned around an ACL injury.
2005, I learned to ski, which arguably was probably one of the more enjoyable years I've had because there's no pressure, no expectation, no negative energy from competition, no nothing. I just got to ski and explore and felt like I was just a little kid. After that, I got introduced to ski racing, which I was a little bit standoffish about. I wasn't looking at 2010, I wasn't looking at competition, I was looking at spandex. That's not my culture, that's not my style at all. I kind of got suckered into it and right away I, I saw something a little bit different that I've never seen before. I saw a run that was fenced off with ski patrol is there in case I have a gnarly crash and the right to go as fast as I want. Okay, okay, I'll give this a shot. And I ended up having a lot of fun. And then I looked at 2010, I said, holy cow. I've always wanted to go to the Olympics. I've always wanted to represent Canada and I've always wanted to do it as a skier. And here's my second chance, my second win to go for it. That gave me a whole new set of goals to reach for. And having that passion, having that drive in my life completely for a few years wiped out the severity of having spinal cord injury. Two thousand and seven ended up winning the Canadian Championships. Two thousand and eight I earned a spot on the World Cup circuit. Got my ass handed to me every weekend. And I didn't like that very much. So I took what I learned, applied it over the summer, brought it to two thousand and nine and won the World Championships, which was kinda crazy. Ended up coming back to Whistler from the World Championships and won the downhill there, which solidified me as one of the skiers that belonged with the best. And I was feeling good. And that just rolled me in quite nicely to the Paralympic Games in Whistler 2010 and brought home a silver medal for Canada, which was outstanding. the Silver Star crew. Dude, I've got a tight posse of amazing riders all competing here at the games that kill it. They keep me motivated and that's just fun coming down there. Well, congratulations. Let's give it up one more time. Go Silver Bronze! I believe in my heart that I couldn't have done what I've done in the period of time that I have without the support network that I have. You know, I always talk about my friends and family in the ski community at large that have been there for me, as they have. But the one person that doesn't get recognized as much as they should is my wife, and it's solely for the sacrifices that she's made in order for me to achieve the dreams that I have. You know, she's the foundation for everything that I do. She's the strength. And more importantly, some of the, the nastiest lines that I've poked was when she's like, I think you can do that. That's obviously why she's in my life. That's like the greatest gift anybody could give me is believing in me. 
my Paralympic experience is probably the highlight of my athletic career. But there's still something missing. You know, I'm not a ski racer, I'm a free skier. This is my dream, this is what I want to do, and I'm not going to be fully satisfied until I give an honest effort to it. No matter what I've been through and how hard it is to race members of that day, nothing beats the feeling of flying to the air. Mark Gavin and I have been good friends for a long time, since well before my accident. He's since become one of the best professional free skiers in the world. And to get to ski with him in a place like this, it just doesn't get any better. Skiing's everything. Everything. My passion and dream has always been to be a skier. And my career has been filled with peaks and valleys and ultimately I got dealt a super shitty card. And I gotta live with that every day. But holding on and staying true to what I love to do and to be a skier and to travel the world, to explore new places and to explore myself through the medium of being a skier, it's it's freedom. Oh, Josh, bringing back the memories, man. I don't know about you, but I haven't watched that for, for a few years now, and um, it still gives me the feels, man. Dougie, it's great to see you, man, and um, appreciate you taking the time to, to pull this one out of the vault and also the time that you gave in 2011 when we built that up. 
it's um it's a pretty brilliant timestamp of where we were at where the sport was at and um I don't know about you, but I, I definitely shed a few tears in there. Some of them were for joy and like, wow, that was pretty cool. And um, there, there was also some tears of like, wow, that was that was a different time. And I was seeing, I was maybe seeing the film for the first time through the lens of others, the way they might have seen it then. It, um, uh, you could one hand say maybe there's a good character in the show, but it was really well produced. And so I, I really, wow. Nice to see Thanks, it again. Buddy. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 fun to watch things with fresh eyes again, and um, and for me, this one stands the test of time. I mean, it's just inspiration, and and I know that uh, as I've encountered hard times over the years, uh, I often find myself coming back to things that you've said or I've I've seen you say, and um, and it's it's helped me get through it. So, thanks, buddy. Welcome. Before we get too far into this, we want to let you know that uh, you can type questions into the chat areas, uh, depending on where you are watching this from. We will do our best to get to them, and if we don't get to them live on the air, we'll do our best to answer them after. Um, so feel free to ask questions. We'll we'll do our best. Um, I guess the first thing, Josh, I'm I'm kind of curious about is is how are you coping with this whole COVID thing? I mean, obviously, I think we're all struggling a little bit with uh, the unknowns here, but um, you've got these added challenges. You also have two young children at home. Um, yeah, how, how's it going for you? Yeah, yeah. Um, let me let me get to that in a second. Come on in, guys. Um, this is Nova. I want to introduce you guys to Nova. So, my buddy Mike, you know Mike. He was asking me a question, how do we deal with this strange time that we're in? And you know, it's this weird virus thing. What are we doing to have fun? Well, we can stay home and we can, we can play games. We can spend time with our family. We can talk to people, Yeah. but still keep our distance. <laughs> yep. You know, one thing that I'm getting out of this time um, is family. So I, I can't help but just count my blessings that we've got little Nova and her brother Hudson, who is somewhere about. That's probably where Lacey is chasing him down. He's uh, three years old and a wild child. So uh, our family, for sure, uh, occupies a bunch of our time. Uh, and the work that I do, it's not slowing down. I'm the director for Freestyle BC, and the association is moving forward as well as can be. And we got a couple high performance teams and 1200 people across the province that we're serving the needs for and, and still planning what uh, the future of our sport will look like come summertime, fall and, and into the winter, at least doing our best. So uh, we, uh, we take this COVID-19 with a grain of salt. We're doing our best to respect the healthcare workers and the elderly that are in care homes right now. Um, so that's like our driving motivation to keep space and the social distancing. And we do a bunch of outdoor activity as well. Like little Huddy's our uh, fearless leader when it comes to playing outside. He's born for it. And there's mom there. There's yeah. Lacey. So that's uh, for sure family is the, the biggest way we spend our time right now. Oh, that's amazing. I'm getting all the feels here just uh, watching you guys. Thanks so much, Nova. And uh, for those great words you just gave to everybody, Lacey, it's so good to see you. We know that uh, you've been such a great pillar of support for Josh over all these years. And uh, you're obviously still crushing it there with your hands full. <laughs> hands are full, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that glitters is not gold. It's crazy. Nova's in grade one French immersion. So Lacey is getting uh, like a crash course on homeschooling, but in a second language that neither of us speak. Um, and then to do that while managing a three-year-old is like, uh, we get up early and we go to bed late and we're usually pretty tired by the end of it. So, um, we're, we're, uh, no doubt, no doubt. Well, so good to see the family. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's tip back toward the phone for just a moment. Bye you guys. Love you guys. Um, I, I guess you know, that the, the process of making the film, I think it took us, it was probably six or seven months we were working on it. Is there, is there a part of that that sort of uh, stands out to you as, as, you know, when you watch the film back, um, something that, that strikes you a little deeper maybe than, than the other parts in the memory bank? I, I for sure come to, to viewing this with uh, less judgment. 
Um, when we first filmed it and I first watched it, I was like, ah, oh, I could have done that line a little bit cleaner or I wish I could have, you know, done that or said this. And um, I felt very hypercritical and I couldn't get over that. And watching it now after a few years of not seeing it, it um, strikes me that there's a sense of vulnerability in the character that I, I was in those moments. Um, I was that wisdom that you said has helped you along the way is helping me in this moment in terms of how we manage adversity and how we face it with humility, with an open mind, with curiosity. And uh, I think I, I shared it quite clearly in there and it was just good to be reminded of the importance of the environment that we surround ourselves with, both the people and the, the natural environment. So obviously we're in a strange time where our relationships are slightly um, shifted in how we can communicate and how we can be with our friends. But uh, I really believe that's one of the keys to how I've been able to manage some of the great challenges in my life is selecting a few really key people that you trust, love and respect to be a part of your life and then making sure you get as much outdoor time as possible. Um, so it was I, quite frankly, Mike, I hear some of the things that came out of my mouth in that video and I'm like, where did that come from? Like, that's pretty, pretty insightful. And uh, I'm not sure. Uh, where it came from, but I think it was a result of being vulnerable and open to the experience. Yeah, I remember when we went to sit down for that interview and I, I, I recall sort of really looking you in the eye and saying like, I, I want to feel like we can go everywhere with this. Like, I really want you to be to be here with me. And, um, and you were like, yep, hundred percent. And, um, you know, still to this day, I've done a lot of interviews in the, uh, in the nine years since then, but, uh, I would say that one was still, uh, the most powerful interview, um, that I've been involved with. So props to you on that. I also, um, one thing that popped into my mind is, is the Chatter Creek section. So first of all, it made me kind of want to go back to Chatter Creek and go skiing because that powder and those pillows looked amazing. But what I recall, and, and one thing that doesn't come across in the film, was how cold it was. And I don't know if you remember, but it was, I think, late December. We were on our way to Chatter Creek, and we almost canceled the trip because of the cold. Uh, the temperatures were around It was one of those situations where we weren't sure because you can't feel your legs, you can't feel your lower body. We were worried about you freezing up. And I remember you being like, ah, I think it'll be fine. <laughs> Let's just go for it. Was, was, that, uh, was, that, was that you being optimistic or were you confident in that? Uh, both optimistic. I was not going to miss an opportunity to go to a paradise that we know as Chatter Creek with a handful of great humans, yourself, Mark Abma, Jeff Thomas. I was like, yeah, please. Um, so there was a little bit of like, I'm not going to miss out on this opportunity that was driving me forward. But there was also an awareness that I enjoy the cold. I, I, I'm not Wim Hof, but I do enjoy cold therapy and I dive into that every day. So um, I, I felt pretty confident that it wouldn't be a hazard to our team. Yeah. It wouldn't be a hazard to my body. And fortunately, it worked out fine. But in reality, Mike, it was so dang cold. I'm actually shivering looking at that footage. It was, we were floating in the mid minus 30s the whole trip. Like there wasn't any reprieve. It was just freezing cold. But it sure made the snow look good. So that was, that was always good. Let's jump into a few questions here, Josh. Um, we're getting some questions coming in. Uh, the first one here from Peter Davis. Uh, can you see more adaptive events in the future of snow sports? I think so. Um, one of the best parts of the Freedom Chair is really the visibility that it created for our sport. And I don't want to say that I was a pioneer back in the day, but there's certainly much less visibility to it. So it felt like we were operating in the Wild West, eh? Like there wasn't a lot of evidence to rely on or previous ski footage to lean into. And uh, I think the work that we've done has created a bit of a foundation. And what we're seeing now is a lot of, a lot more talented riders and a level that's even higher than where we left it off. So with that kind of critical mass in place, I think uh, there's certainly an opportunity to see more structured events uh, for, for Sitski, Big Mountain. I know that the Live It Love It Foundation is doing some work in Revelstoke with their Big Mountain camps. Um, there's some guys down in Tahoe with the High Fives Foundation that are doing a lot of progressive park work 
it's insane what those guys are doing right now. So I feel like it's there if um, the demand is there, the opportunity is there, the mass is there to to create some pretty cool events and opportunities. And I'm like the question. Uh, I'm curious to see where it goes. Yeah. Um, another question coming in here, um, and and so you obviously had some some success at the 2010 uh, Paralympic Games here in Whistler, Vancouver. Uh, the question is, do you think you've reached your best in terms of racing, or is that in the future? I think I know the answer to this, but um, but just talk about your racing career and how that evolved. Obviously, uh, the success in in 2010. Uh, th- this was filmed in 2011. Um, you know, I, I guess, would you consider the, uh, Sochi Paralympics to be your pinnacle of, of your race career? Uh, yeah, well, for sure. It had to have been, cause that was where I ended things off. Uh, I took a sidestep from ski racing after the games in Sochi 2014. And, and, um, it's a long story and I'll save that one for another time, but there was so much energy that had built up into the games at Sochi that uh, I put down, I was a force to be reckoned with internally and externally. Um, I competed in five events and I blew up in three of them and I podiumed in the remaining two. And uh, arguably if I didn't blow up in the the first three, I probably would have been on podium as well. So it was, I was peaking as an athlete, which was a credit to my coaches and their planning to, to, um, to position my energy and my skills in a way that was ready to, to fire on all cylinders. Um, I, I, I'm like every old man that just like, you know, back in my day, I would have been throwing a straighter ball a lot farther down the line. Um, but in reality, like I went to Pyeongchang and I saw the level of the ski racing there and they've certainly, as you would expect, raised the bar in that four year span. And, uh, I was quite thankful that I wasn't in the gate because this old man, I don't think I would have been a threat to the competition and, uh, you know, seeing where they're at even now, two years later, um, I'm loving following both the race side and the free ski side of things. And the, uh, the gauntlet has been passed and uh, the level of riding's there. The question was about me. Have I peaked? Absolutely not, but I'm not training nearly enough to even think that I'll find that peak. So I'm, I'm humbled and thankful that some other athletes have, picked up the torch and are progressing the sport in a way that it needs to be. Yeah. You've, uh, you've, you've done uh, some incredible things um, in those gates. Um, just, just to be clear here, we've got a question coming in. Uh, what is your level of in- injury? Just specify for us. That's a great question. Uh, T11 complete. So in the spinal cord world, that is like basically from my belly button up is where I have muscle and control and below that is all paralyzed. Okay, well, so before we get back into some more questions here, um, I, I, wanna, I wanna talk about uh, where things went after we filmed the Freedom Chair. So um, it was actually just sort of the beginning of our relationship uh, as, as uh, athlete, athlete motivator and, and filmmaker. Um, I remember, I wanna say it was it was probably during the tour, the film tour we did with the Freedom Chair, and you came to me and you you kind of whispered in my ear that you had something that you really wanted to try and do, and that was to <laughs> get upside down. I um I had a friend of mine whisper to me right after I broke my back in 2004. He's like, "Do you think he could do freestyle? Like, do you think he could do a backflip?" And initially, I was like, "Oh, that's got to be no problem." And then I learned a sitski, and I realized that might be a problem. That's pretty, that's 40 pounds of metal strapped to a paralyzed lower half that I'm going to try and tip upside down. And uh, I shelved the idea for a while. And uh, maybe in 2010 or 2011, I started to dabble at Woodward's in their uh, indoor uh, ramp and foam pit and started to see a possibility again. And uh, I figured you might be one of the only people that had the wherewithal and trust with me to go down that path and uh, to explore to see if that was even something that we wanted to do as a team, right? It was for sure a team effort to to build that that jump. Like I think my buddy Miles Ricketts who worked all night in the dark to shape up a mound of snow so that when we got up in the morning, we could make an effort. And uh, I think about Trennan and Bushy and and that whole crew that gave themselves to a project, right? They were no different than you and I. They were just curious if we could do something that was unique 
and uh, up to that point hadn't been attempted and we thought hey what the heck you know seems like the right group and the right time and and uh, it's, it was it was it was awesome well we've been teasing it here for a few minutes so let's get right to it uh the very first sitski backflip uh performed here by josh duke we have a clip Not just a backflip, my friend, but that was a monster backflip. Uh, still to this day, the most inspiring and impressive thing I've ever seen done on snow. Um, t talk us through that and watching that back again there. Mm, it was it was a bit of a process, right? We started at Woodward's and we flirted with the possibility and then you and I had that conversation and then it came to an airbag. And uh, another cold day. It feels like when you and I plan something, Mike, it always ends up being well below freezing. And I remember it would have been the middle of January that uh, we had set the bag up on the Black Home Park. And uh, you and Miles and Thomas uh, spent a bunch of time setting the bag and the camera gear up. And then me being nervous, I was like, I got to go down to my truck. So down to Lot 8 I go. And out of my sit ski into my wheelchair have a, a quick pee break and then back up to the top and now I'm trying to psych myself up like I got this man I got this and like don't be afraid it's just an airbag and I'm like oh, I'd rather do it in the backcountry not on an airbag and you know what happened next right you know the next bus stop in our journey that day um, and for for those tuning in it was uh, it was probably the worst day that many of us um, had experienced in, in a while, right? Mike had got the call from Sarah Burke's family that she had succumbed to her injury um, that she sustained a week before. And so uh, Mike obviously knowing Sarah really well and all of us having a relationship with Sarah, uh, Mike's just like, we don't need to do this today. We can hold the pin. And uh, I was like, well, I'm not sure that's what Sarah would have wanted. I think Sarah was all about progression and, uh, you know, just finding a way to have fun with your friends in the mountains. And so it, uh, in my heart felt like let love lift us higher. And I, I'm pretty confident that it was a spirit of Sarah that helped elevate all of us in that moment and, uh, stomped seven out of seven on that airbag. And that gave me the confidence to, and I would say gave our entire team confidence to uh, to bring it into the backcountry and a few weeks later we we did find ourselves in that environment with a perfect booter and we had ourselves darn near a perfect day yeah and, and one of the really special things i mean obviously the feet the the sitski backflip was was the thing but but uh, uh, in second place for me that day was uh was uh having rory bushfield along rory was sarah's husband obviously in those weeks after Sarah's passing um, were incredibly difficult for Rory and, and he'd been struggling a bit for sure. And this was the first time that he came out, uh, sort of came out and, and kind of had a little sense of real life again, of normalcy and to come out and be part of that day and have his enthusiasm um, as he pulled you up the hill each time that you made an attempt uh, was, was kind of the icing on the cake. Yeah, yeah. He played the role of big brother, mentor, and coach all at once, which was certainly uh, in that moment enough to pull him away from, you know, his central focus, which was the devastation of losing, uh, losing his wife. Um, and, and it was fun to watch his energy build as the day went on and like, okay, dude, like when I get nervous in the backcountry and I'm about to film, he's like, don't worry about the filmers. Just like focus on yourself make sure that you're ready. Why don't we go to the top? dude? This is where they do all the heli skiing for Whistler. I'll just drag you up there. Let's go get some free skiing and let those guys build the jump. And, and, uh, he just played that role of a comforting big bro. And, and, uh, I know a lot of people when they drag me around, behind their snowmobile are quite tentative and always looking over their shoulder, but not the Bushman. <laughs> Bushman's full <laughs> throttle all the way. And uh, it just, it felt so good for me to have that big brother that was not looking at me as a kid with a disability, but just looking at me as his buddy that was out for a rip. 
and uh, you know that type of humanity in in Bushy, not only in that moment, but that's just how he operates. Was certainly just another stroke of confidence that I needed to do something that, again, nobody had gone upside down, and we also built a cheese wedge to the moon, right? <laughs> like, there's a photo that Paul Morrison took that I'm literally jumping over the sun. Like, it's it was um, it was great. It was awesome. Yeah, I did. I mean, there were several several attempts uh, that went into that final successful jump. Um, what was going through your mind? I mean, this question just came in from Webzy, but what was going through your mind on that successful attempt? Like, at what point did you realize that this is the one, and, and how did that feel? Mm -hmm. It was actually that's just uh, a moment of pure trust, right? Because we had gone through at that point six dress rehearsals. A couple of them I landed, but not clean enough in my book. <clears throat> and it was uh, Kevin Painter, who's like currently the head coach of the Canadian Halfpipe team, and also one of my mentors growing up in the Kimberly Freestyle Club. And Trenton just like, dude, be patient. I know it's going to be the hardest thing that you have to do right now, but be super patient on the lift. Like you keep reaching off the lip of the jump. And just like you did before you broke your back, just like really force yourself to stare at the horizon and just let the jump do the work. And it's so hard to do that, to get out of your own way and what you think you need to do and to follow the guidance of somebody who knows more than more than I do. Uh, and just be like, trust, 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 stare at the horizon, stare at the horizon. And uh, eventually it just came around the way it should have been. So thanks, Trent. That was awesome. Totally. Um, I mean, one of the, I don't, I don't think this was ever part of any of our motivations uh, for documenting this, this feat, but I recall the day after uh, the short film that we made about it called Sitski Backflip came out, um, I, my phone started ringing at my house at about 4 a.m. and it just kept ringing and my wife was like, what's going on? You know, we thought someone had died or something. And it turned out to be all the big morning shows in the U.S., all the news shows like uh, the Today Show and Good Morning America and all these things. And they wanted the clip for their, for their morning programs. And so I remember uh, being on the phone, I think I called you or your phone probably had started ringing off the hook um, shortly after. And... Um, and you kind of went, like you became this bit of a mainstream media star for a little bit. Uh, walk us through that and then let me know like what the highlight of that whole experience was. Um, we filmed on a Friday, I believe, a Thursday or Friday, we we're in the back country and then we had Sushi Village dinner and you said, how do you want the edit to look? And do you want to look at any of the clips? I was like, no, I'll wait for it to drop on Monday. And like you, after it dropped, everything started to blow up rapidly to the point that I woke up at first thing in the morning and I was like, refresh, refresh on the Solomon Free Ski page so that I could see the footage. I hadn't seen it over the weekend and I was, you know, really yearning to, to see what this backflip looked like because I knew what it felt like. And it was like 10,000 views. I'm like, that counter must be busted because I just logged on. Like it just, and it just like, in that moment, I knew something special was about to happen. Um, <laughs> the next morning, I get a call from uh, Ellen. She's like, hi, this is Ellen from the Ellen DeGeneres show. I'm like, back the truck up? Like, what? She's like, I get that all the time. I'm your assistant. But Ellen saw your video, and she loved it, and she would love to meet you. Is that something that you'd be into doing? I said, well, yeah, but tickets for two. I got to bring my wife, right? Like, it's not uh, – and so, obviously, that was a no-brainer for the team there. And um, there's certainly a highlight in meeting a celebrity of that status. Um, but it's not the celebrity that makes me appreciate Ellen. It's um, her humility and her appreciation for humanity. And if we want to talk about somebody that's gone through adversity in their life and career, for sure, like have a look in the history books of Ellen DeGeneres. Um, she's paid her dues. And with her success, she just makes a great effort to improve the life of, of the people around her and make humanity just that much more friendly, playful and accepting for, for all of us that inhabit this little blue globe. Uh, and then second to meeting somebody as um, potent as Ellen was uh, the after effect. I was doing probably 15 to 20 interviews a day while competing um, with media agencies all around the globe that were arguably more interested in what what it was like to meet Ellen than they were the backflip. And uh, but you know, regardless of their motivations, it uh, it certainly cast a light on um, our sport 
and the potential of, of, of humanity when we put our minds towards a goal. And, uh, and, and also some of the great work that the, the partners that I've had in my life have, have allowed me to achieve, like the High Fives Foundation. They've been a great part of my life and journey, and they've helped hundreds of people as well. So uh, for sure, the media reel was work after it happened, but it was totally worthwhile. Like, look at where we're at today. Yeah, well, speaking of where we're at today, um, you are, are, are you, would you consider yourself retired from your professional ski career at this point? Uh, or your well, competitive yeah. ski, per, ski career, I would say? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm done with competing and my priority is definitely focused on my family and as well just the, uh, the director role with Freestyle BC takes up a huge amount of my time. But it's, yeah, I don't know how you feel, Mike, but like, are you retired? Like, I still feel well, like this will do some tricks, eh? Like, I feel like I could go out there and um, I, I still feel like the question was like, um, is there more in front of you? Like, it, and it was on the the focus of racing. And I, no, I'm I'm not going to get back into that world. But uh, in terms of free skiing and stuff like that, like I'm still that same kid, and I still have that same drive and desire. And uh, I'm learning to be a little more patient and wait for the right opportunities present themselves. Versus when I was younger, I was like hungry to get after every moment and every opportunity and. And now I just focus on keeping my body in, in reasonably good shape. So if those opportunities present themselves, whether I'm on a surfboard, mountain bike, or ski, that uh, I'm ready to send her. Well, speaking of, of who's next and what's next, um, there are some impressive uh, adaptive athletes doing some really cool stuff today. And I, I know that the High Fives Foundation down uh, in Lake Tahoe uh, founded by Roy Tuscany, uh, is doing incredible work and and has had uh, some great successes in getting people back into the mountains and back onto snow and on the water and, and doing what they love to do. Talk a little bit about, about high fives and also about who you're watching uh, to carry the torch of, of sit skiing and, and adaptive skiing. Uh, well, first on the high fives, I'm hyped just to be a part of that Ohana and Roy and his crew have done a phenomenal job of creating a sense of family and community amongst a group of mostly mountain sport athletes that have had life altering injury and uh, to be a client or uh, I'm not sure how Roy frames it, but um, he supported me quite a bit in my journey in the early days with some of my equipment needs. He's brought me in to be mentored by um, other folks that have lived with injury longer than I have and have a great wealth of experience. And he's allowed me to be a mentor to other um, young athletes that are just going through this transition in life. Um, and, and that community support network is brilliant and certainly gives me strength and hope in my life. And it's hard to think that <clears throat> the success of guys like uh, Jay Ross and Trevor Kennison isn't directly correlated to the work that the High Fives Foundation does. And uh, if if you know me personally, you know that I don't pay attention to social media. Uh, I just uh, kind of removed that from my life in the last few years. But I do get wind from some of my friends about this silly stuff that these guys are doing. And I saw a highlight reel of, um, of uh, Trevor doing some rails, and it was out of this world. I've heard rumors he made going upside down. Um, he's revolutionized that notion again. I don't have all the details behind that, but I think the world's going to be in for a treat. We're looking at Corbett's right now. Like, I don't know that I've ever dropped anything that large <laughs> and certainly not onto that kind of landing area. It looked pretty hard. Um, and he went for it in front of a huge crowd. Like, that's uh, that's not my bag. I'm more of a backcountry on my own or with a small crew, but he is quite the performer for sure. And uh, and uh, Jay Raws, like I've seen footage of him doing like cork three, cork five, and then linking them up. Oh, yeah, it's, <clears throat> uh, the boys are doing just fine. But uh, again, I think a lot of it is a result of the community that's been developed um, by High Fives Foundation and allowing everybody to come together and work together and I don't know, in the little life experience that I have, I do believe that community is one of the most important things, um, having that sense of belonging. And that's for sure why um, skiing is so important to me, because it's done just that. It's given me a place to belong and a place to shine.
Yeah, and there's there's a look at the uh, the social media handles if you're really mm. curious about the front edge of adaptive uh, snow sport. Uh, these are some great Instagram accounts to follow right here. Trevor Kennison, High Fives Foundation, and JRaw1695. Um, Josh, I know we are getting pinched on time. You are a busy guy. You've got a meeting coming up very shortly. Um, for the people asking questions, uh, we'll try and get to the questions that are outstanding in the comments of the video. We'll do our best to, to answer once this is done. But, you know, a lot of people are struggling right now. Um, there's, we are going through unprecedented times. You've had uh, your fair share of struggles over the years. What's your advice? As a, you know, you're a motivational speaker um, is one of your hats that you wear. Um, you know, in, in a minute or two, what, what's your advice to people that are, that are really having a hard time right now? I appreciate your sensitivity to my time, Mike, but I'm gonna stretch this one out if I can. This dialogue is, is so good. What would my advice be? Um, <clears throat> it varies, right? Um, adversity, well, let's look back at one of the greatest Canadians of all time. Arguably, and in my opinion, the greatest Canadian of all time, Terry Fox. Uh, and he's got a, a great book uh, built for kids um, that reads, uh, the title is The Value in Facing a Challenge. And I think if we just tip it upside down, you know, rather than seeing adversity as the... Uh, the enemy or something we're here to avoid, if we look at it as an opportunity to grow, I think that's a really good perspective to take on whatever your adversity may be. In the moment when I broke my back, uh, <clears throat> out of the ether came this mantra, if you will, uh, in the ambulance ride down when I, I was uh, physically paralyzed, but not knowing the severity, but I was like emotionally paralyzed with fear that uh, my life was gonna be crippled. Uh, and, and the mantra was, everything happens for a reason, nothing happens that we're not strong enough to deal with. And everything in life had prepared me for that moment. And I really hang on to that. I, I know not everybody agrees with that sentiment, um, but for me, it's certainly a really good reminder um, for uh, an essence of our life experience, you know. Uh, adversity comes in many different shapes and forms. It doesn't have to be um, that that monumental or life-changing um, and it can be right like uh, challenges uh, <clears throat> you face them all the time mike you are a mountaineer and you love to play in the mountains and being an athlete or whatever it might be we we have we have a capacity to um build the tolerance with the unknown and so whether i'm preparing for a ski race or you're preparing for a backcountry trip we look at the environment we look at all the variables we address the ones that we have any sort of influence or control over. And at that point, we can make some critical decisions. Is the risk worth, uh, is it worth the reward? Is the trip worth going on? How much risk do I want to take on the racetrack? Whatever it might be. And <clears throat> with that information, I think it's, it's so powerful to venture off into the unknown because uh, there's always going to be some degree of uncertainty. And that's certainly what life feels like today in this little COVID chapter. There's a great deal of uncertainty. And what I would encourage people to do is have uh, have a close look at the environments that you work and live within and see what variables you can control. And the rest of it, you just have to let go. And in the example of being in the start gate, you know, it, it's incredibly vulnerable. And there's a huge sense of unknown. Like just imagine any athlete at the top of a course um, whether it's life and death. Um, and there's a really beautiful quote in All I Can by the Rocky Mountain Sherpas. And it's just like, we have to surrender to the unknown and we don't really know what's going to happen until we drop in. And you could drop in and make that first turn and just cartwheel down the line, or it could be the beginning of something that you didn't even think that you were capable of. And uh, I know, Mike, you've probably had that experience several times in the backcountry. I've had that in racing. Um, you have to surrender to, you might make a fool of yourself in front of all your friends and you might actually just go off and do something that nobody thought was achievable and then shift the way people look at the world. Again, that's a fairly grand and dramatic explanation to it, but that would be kind of my general take on adversity right now is embrace it with an open heart and an open mind. And, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I totally agree. For me, it's lots of little goals. It's lots of little steps that, that make you feel like you're getting 
somewhere that you're not just on this treadmill of doom, you know, like, like uh, making a nice dinner or getting out for a walk around the neighborhood. Just these little things that, that you set your mind to really help, help uh, keep, keep things in perspective a little bit. I'm just going to throw a couple things in there because uh, a friend of mine just gave me some great advice on goal setting and that uh, the two things to successfully achieve your goals is set a timeline so you know when that goal is to be achieved and hold yourself accountable so that you know, have somebody that you trust or love or maybe even just write it down if that works for you um, but create those two benchmarks you know how are you going to be held accountable and what's your timeline to achieve that goal. I want to have dinner tonight. Well, there's your timeline. Who are you going to be accountable to? My family, because if I don't feed them, they're going to get real hungry and irritable. That's an easy one. Um, that's a great point, Mike. Little goals, baby steps along the way help us to um, move forward. And uh, as my old man would say, uh, the reward is intrinsic to the effort. You know, if we set small goals and we feel like we're making small accomplishments along the way, and uh, that that was definitely a part of my journey right after I broke my back. Like. I will sit up today from the hospital bed. And it was like, check. It wasn't like, oh shit, I'm in a wheelchair and my life sucks. It was like, I sat up today and it's like, I'm not gonna shit my pants today. Sorry guys, I don't know if this is PG or not, but like <laughs> the reality of having a disability ain't pretty. And it's like, I would check that off the box. I'm like, all right, I had a good day. <laughs> um, and, and slow and steady. And I saw all those as massive rewards rather than the inverse of like, what uh, an incredible inconvenience a lot of living with a spinal cord injury can really actually be. No doubt. Um, let's, in our last few minutes here, let's just rattle off uh, quick answers on a few of the questions floating around. Um, advice for, for kids, youth, people training in a sit ski. What are your mm -hmm. most important steps? What are the, how, do you, how do you make some progress there? Mm, especially kids and youth, find a way to love it. And I... If you really enjoy what you do, then the work isn't going to seem insurmountable. And the reality is to be good at anything that you want to do, you're going to have to put in a ton of work. And if you're not enjoying yourself and you haven't set a good foundation as to why you're there and why you're doing what you're doing, then it will most likely burn you out um, in the sense. So like if you are a young kid learning to sit ski, just play, just have fun and explore every environment that you can. And, and challenge yourself to ski from a green to a blue and a blue to a black. And as you really start pushing yourself, make sure you got a good buddy with you. Like I don't really dare any environments without somebody who can help excavate myself in the sit ski, but just really progress that. And then, you know, when you get a little bit older into your late teens, if that's your target, then uh, really get involved in some ski racing programs. But ultimately in those early years, just have fun just have fun and challenge yourself in every possible environment. And maybe uh, the, the solution might be if you can enjoy skiing in the rain, if you can enjoy skiing on ice, if you can enjoy skiing in all the crud conditions that old farts like me avoid, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a blue weather kind of guy now, but you got to get good at skiing and all the junk in order to really appreciate the good days. And uh, that's how you're going to get better too. Excellent advice. Um, your next adventure, what's what's on the horizon for you when it comes to doing cool stuff? Next adventure, eh? Well, I always uh, jump open arms anytime the High Fives invites me to a surf camp. Mm, I, uh, I'm rolling 40 this year. <laughs> and I my dream would be to, uh, to make a trip to Japan with my buddy Jeff from La Grande Adventures and bring 10 of my best buddies uh over to japan and do a little bit of cat skiing over there i've i've heard wonderful stories i've dreamt of it for a long time that's definitely on my bucket list uh and i i would say i'm quite involved in in mountain biking right now in uh, helping develop more infrastructure here in the province and uh trail development and stuff like that so uh, it's uh, my adventures are a little wider in variety right now a little ski a little surf a little bike and a whole lot of family time at the same time. Oh, I suppose if you're talking adventures, I got a 1977, 18 foot travel trailer. And as soon as COVID's lifted, I bet I'm gonna hit that dirty trail and be on the road for a few months visiting and hugging all my friends as soon as I can. Yeah, that's a good one. Well, speaking of biking, a uh, question here. Uh, can you take adaptive bikes at the Silver Star Bike Park? Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. The six pack chair holds the adaptive bike quite well and their staff is trained on how to, to load the bikes. And uh, so I just transfer off my rig. Uh, they throw the bike on the back and then same thing, hop back on the bike on the top and off you go. Excellent. Uh, you got a, got a spirit animal there, buddy? Yeah, the dupe. I saw that one coming a mile away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have a gun here to show you, but I got a small little python. Um, the uh, the great blue heron. I had that tattooed on in December, and it was definitely uh, <laughs> a very last minute decision while I was in Hawaii, and uh, my brother in law was getting a tattoo, and I was like, "You think the the other guy has time?" And he's like, "Let me ask him." He's like, "Yeah, he's got time to do a tattoo." I'm like, "That's kind of a." A fun brotherly thing to do with your brother-in-law and the artist is like what are you gonna get done I'm like oh buddy I don't know I'm like that beats me and so we started chatting and um, long and short of it is uh, between 2010 and 2014 our team psychologist brought in a shaman or a First Nations elder to take us through the experience of finding our spirit animal and you can imagine here I am in the heart of Whistler with this elder who's guiding me through a process to identify i'm like i'm gonna be a wolf or i'll be a bear or something awesome like that and uh she's like yeah no i saw your animal quite clearly in my vision you're the great blue heron and i was like son of a, a bird <laughs> but i'll tell you the the lessons that the heron have provided in patience in in observation in uh well like i say i don't need to get after it every single day but um when it's time to get after it, I'm ready. Uh, and and furthermore, um, may my mom and dad rest in peace. They both passed away last year. Of, uh, I, I don't know how to say natural causes. Mom was heart failure, dad was cancer. But um, They also lived their final days in a care home called Heron Grove. And so clearly that just reinforced the goofiness of my spirit animal with uh, the symbolism of not wanting to, uh, even for a moment, forget the important lessons my parents have bestowed. Well, I thank you so much, Josh. Um, I think I feel like we could just go on chit chatting all day and reminiscing and telling stories and making ourselves feel better and all these kinds of things. It has been an absolute pleasure. We've been going for just over an hour now. Um, I think we'll wrap it up. But thanks again, my friend. I wish you and your family nothing but the best in getting through uh, this latest challenge. Um, I have no doubt you guys will will fly. Uh, really soon so thanks buddy and um, I wish you all the best moving forward great to see you Mike thanks for having me and to everybody from Freestyle BC who's tuned in everybody from high fives and everybody else that uh, made a little bit of time today I hope hope you enjoyed and are able to take something away and uh, again thanks for the opportunity to to be a part of the conversation yeah that's it thank you everyone for tuning in um, this is just one part of the series of the Solomon TV Lives. Uh, we will have another one coming at you in just over a week, so be uh, on the lookout for that. And um, this will also live on the Solomon channel so that it can be watched again if, uh, if you have friends that may have missed it today. So thanks a lot. Stay safe, everyone, and uh, we'll hopefully see you in the mountains soon.